here in the way. Okay, as you start looking back at your drawing, and if you need to draw, feel free to do so. Who decided to draw the mud in the middle of your paper? Wonderful. Who drew it at the top of the paper? Okay. Who drew it at the bottom of the paper? Okay, just two. All right. Who drew a really big mug? Really big? Okay. Who drew kind of a medium-sized mug? Okay. And who drew a really small one? Okay. Interesting. Anyone want to show us your mug picture right now? No? <laughs> Oh, I like it. Very good. Fine. You got all the tiger stripes on there. Very good. Like it? And you did small and in the middle. And then small and coming down. Why did you decide to put the mug right there? Because the level that I see is below. Very good. On the level that you see. All right. Anyone else want to show their mug drawing? That's really good. That is fantastic. Okay, did all of you know that you absolutely did not do as I asked this morning? Not a single person in here completed this assignment. Why is that? From the perspective of your chair, what does that mean? If the angle would be different, wouldn't it? Would we have like not drawn anything? Like a chair, and chairs don't have eyes. So. Very good. <laughs> no, I, I completely see where you're coming from. You're ready for a college classroom. I like that answer. Anyone else? Did anyone actually get down to chair level? No, absolutely not. Did anyone try to look at the mug from their chair? Very good. That's awesome. I'll tell you what, I absolutely failed this assignment as well. Because this assignment is meant for a lot of people to fail unless you are an art major and those individuals are all about sitting on the chair and making sure the mug looks correct. But the rest of us, when we hear from perspective, what perspective did we think of? Our perspective. Our perspective. So what happened? What would you call this mishap that we just had? Misinterpretation. Misinterpretation. Looking for another word. Miscommunication. Absolutely. Did we just experience a miscommunication? And how long did it take you to do this assignment? I've got to close the door. Can Stay. Okay. That's way better, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Miscommunication. How long did it take for that miscommunication to happen? The second you walked in the door. Yet, how long within your lifetime have you been communicating? Do you remember your very first communication? Oh, probably cried, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then, how many times have you communicated today? Not a lot. Sitting and watching. Okay. How many individuals have communicated with you this morning? Five or six. I would say since I got in this door, I've been pretty bombarded. Yeah. From the moment just trying to get across the building, I've had a lot of voices coming at me telling me this and that. So communication is very much a part of our lives, isn't it? But how many times do we see it maybe messed up? Do we see it in a way that's not effective? Or do we see communication that just completely misses the mark? How many YouTube videos do we have making fun of celebrities who just, oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Taylor Swift, but I had to talk about Kanye, right? That really was terrible. Terrible public relations, all about communication. So as a communication instructor myself, I see it as so important. Not only with what you do today, but also what you do in your college career, and also what you do beyond that. Because each and every one of you has a voice, and each and every one of you can use that voice, and that is a powerful tool that you will always have. So who wanted to have a college lecture this morning? Not a single person on a Saturday morning wants to hear a lecture, right? Yeah, I personally do not either, and I am a college instructor. I prefer to have more of a learning session. I prefer for you to gain some information, and that's why this early assignment is just for you to experiment with how it feels to be told, wow, I did that wrong, even though I had that piece of paper, I knew how I wanted to approach this drawing, I knew what I wanted to do, 
but I still missed the mark. And when I went through this assignment, I thought, uh-uh, oh, no, I did it the right way. Don't tell me I did it the wrong way. This all boils down to competent communication. What is competent communication? Lots of understanding. Mm -hmm. And feel free just to shout out. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that competent communication means is when you're able to get your view, views across effectively. Absolutely. Getting that view across effectively. There's understanding, there's effectiveness, correct? So within my college classrooms, I always assess students based on the eight public speaking competencies. And it's a relief to kind of have this look at communication because communication is not only about what you're doing in the moment, is it? But it also has to do a lot with your preparation. And when we hear preparation, what type of communication do we think of? Speeches. Speeches. Who hears the term public speaking and says, yes, that's me? Awesome, good. I like that. That's fine. Who says, uh, no, are you crazy? No, I'm not doing that. I hear you. And who says, I don't care, I'll talk to anybody anytime, just depends on what it's about. All right, very good. That does tend to be a lot of us. Some of us say, yes, it's public speaking, I adore it. Some of us say, mm, not so much. And some say, hey, I can do it if need be, but I'm not gonna jump and volunteer first, maybe. We'll see, what is it about, basically? So with the eight public speaking competencies, you focus not only what you do up here, but also on what you do as part of your preparation. Preparation is huge. So we have eight competencies listed out here. The first four are all about what you do before you deliver a speech, and the last four are about what you do while you're up here. Who's concerned about the prep part more than delivery? Okay, good to know. And who's more concerned about delivery? What am I supposed to do while I'm up there? Okay, good to know. So as you begin to prepare, this is in a classroom, this is in an organization, in a business, whenever you deliver any type of communication. So if you do happen to snag a job and you have a team meeting, this fits. Whatever you're doing, this really fits. So the first thing you have to focus on is making sure that your topic is focused and appropriate for the audience timing and occasion. So how would you feel about this kind of presentation? Can someone read this out loud to me? And for my five minute presentation, I have 123 slides on a Chinese. <laughs> this is a true story. <coughs> this is a very true example. Five minute presentation, 123 slides. What does that equal? Boring. Boring. Have you tuned out already? Do you kind of already have that phone coming out and Facebook up maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. We have to make sure that whatever we plan to say, whatever we plan to talk about while we're up here, it's narrowed down. If I have five minutes, can I talk about the whole of Chinese culture? No, but can I talk about cuisine, food? Yeah. Food is always a good topic, absolutely. I also have to think about my audience. If I got up here and said, I'm going to talk to all of you about the economic development of Bangalore, India, and share with you all these exciting facts about it, right? How do you feel? Interested. Interested. How might a lot of people feel? I'm not engaged in that topic. I really don't care. So there could be a disconnect there, put it there. But let's say that I was going to give these facts, this information to maybe an organization, a call center that's about to outsource to Bangalore, India. How do you think that audience looks? They might be a little more interested. Mm -hmm. It is going to affect them, isn't it? I want my audience to look like this, right? So what's my point behind this? That the topic that you are discussing about has to depend also on the type of audience that you are talking to and also the setting where that audience is. It's mm -hmm. like a high school audience or an audience of professional scientists. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But well, what are you supposed to do if you're just given it? If you're just given a certain topic, how are you supposed to determine? I love that question. <laughs> yeah. What if you happen to get up here and this is your topic and you have no choice? You have to deliver on rocket fuel to a kindergarten class. Why well, start getting out some paper and crayons and have them draw a rocket, baby, and talk about how the fuel helps the ship go, right? You take a moment to pause. Always take a moment to pause, look at your audience, get to know them, and go from there. I think there's a lot of topics that are dry and boring that could come across so interesting 
but make sure it's about you and what you bring to that audience. That's a fantastic question. Brings me to my next point. Who knows who Gordon Ramsay is? Excellent. Who knows who Steve Jobs is? Oh my gosh. The late Steve Jobs. Who wants Gordon Ramsay to teach you how to use an iPad or an iPhone? That would be hilarious. That's a whole reality television show right there, isn't it? Yeah. Who wants to hear Steve Jobs teach you how to use an iPhone? If he came back. Poor late Steve Jobs. But who wants him to teach you how to cook something? Beef Wellington or something along those lines. It'd be pretty funny. But if I had a choice of an expert or someone who might not know, who would I choose? The expert. Are you an expert? Nope. Depends on what. Depends on what. Who says I'm an expert at something? Who says I'm not an expert at all? You're all an expert. You are all an expert at something using. Even if it's bizarre, even if it's out there, you are all an expert. We all have passion about something. We all love something. So. Whenever you walk into a room, think who is your audience and how will I be speaking to them? If I was in a kindergarten classroom and I started out with this, what would those kindergartners do? Then they'd walk away, they'd be running around with a day. I'd probably have glue and glitter all over myself one and I. That would be terrible. But for a more professional audience such as you, it really helps to connect. So know who you're talking to, know what they're about. I've chosen my topic, I have to make sure I communicate that, don't I? Have you ever seen a presentation where they get up here and they just start talking? Hey, today my name is blah, 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 and here's this, and here's that, here's this, here's that. And then you feel completely lost, don't you? Is a speech like that ever going to be effective? No. So there's one thing that you can do in the very beginning of your speech to make it clear for the audience. Who in here is a fantastic listener? You guys rock. I wish I was like you. Who says, I know I'm not a good listener? There's a couple of us who say, I just don't connect as well to listening. To help your audience listen, have that thesis statement ahead of time. Have you been working nonstop on thesis statements a lot? I remember those days. When you get up here to speak, keep it simple. Today I'm going to talk to you about A, B, and C. I'd like to share my knowledge of this and that. This simple statement will help you to increase your professional appearance, but also help your audience to say, ah, oh, that's where you're going, that's what you're doing with this speech really helps people to connect. Our third competency is all about our supporting material. Supporting material, the non-electronic as well as the electronic. Non-electronic are a lot of your journal articles and a lot of sources you might find in newspaper. If you're up here delivering a speech, you want to quote Wikipedia the entire time? I would say no. I would absolutely say no. I like Wikipedia, I think it's neat. But it's just a starting point. Make sure that you have some credible sources. I'm not going into that this morning, though. But if we talk about electronic sources, what do you think of? Primary sources. Primary um, sources? Yeah, like uh, CNN and stuff like that. CNN, mm hmm What's an electronic source? Huh? iPhone. iPhone, mm hmm Have we used PowerPoint? <laughs> PowerPoint and Prezi. Yeah. PowerPoint tells me who's used PowerPoint. What do you think of PowerPoint? I love it. Huh? I love it. Love it. Huh? It's dry. It's dry. <laughs> I have to lean. It can be done well, but I kind of have to lean to it's dry. Why is it dry? Because it's it's usually the same. It has like tin transitions, and it's always the same tin transitions, mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. background and stuff. Like that. Mm -hmm. Same template. Yes. Yeah, we love that template word. Ever seen a PowerPoint with Clipper? Yeah. That's death for me. I would disagree because mm -hmm. the um, the transitions and the backgrounds and stuff they can be um, they can be aggregated to convey what you're trying to say and make it yeah. interesting and relevant to mm -hmm. what you're presenting. About. They absolutely can. It has to be done very well though. It has to be used well. If it's slide after slide of just text. Are you interested? No. Did you need to show up for that? No, I could have emailed that to you and you have the information, right? What are your thoughts? I was going to say with your eye too, because mm -hmm. we most of my PowerPoint can just read off of them the entire time. Absolutely. Couldn't I just stand back here and read off of this? Isn't that painful to look at? Yeah. And that's something I could easily do, couldn't I? I could get right here on the projector light and blind myself and then just read from this the entire time. And if I do that in a speech, who is my audience suddenly? Bunch of confused 
people, it's a piece of plastic too, isn't it? Why, in this day and age, in 2015, for crying out loud, are we talking to a piece of plastic? But you're not technically the speaker if you're reading on the thing, but you're board not. is the speaker. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If I was downstairs, <coughs> downstairs in Armstrong Hall, talking to a plastic water bottle, what would you think about me? <laughs> Absolutely. But I'm not crazy if I talk to this piece of plastic. What's the difference? I say we have to connect to our audience. We have to break that barrier. I am a Prezi fan. I like the layers. I like the way it looks because a lot of times, based on how I use it, I don't have an audience like this. Prezi, I just, it's my best friend. I teach it in all my classrooms now. Steve Jobs, of course, had to put down PowerPoint. We all know why, right? Good, good. Those who know what they're talking about, they don't need PowerPoint, do they? If I know what I'm talking about, it's right here and it's me. I cannot stand when I hear all the technology fail I can't deliver my speech. What do you mean you can't deliver your speech because the technology failed? What are you talking about? Where's your speech? Or the individuals who have index cards, and suddenly you drop those index cards. Where's your speech? Just in your mind, in your heart. Is something you're passionate In your mind. Be passionate. Absolutely. Do we have a thought? Uh, like in my school, if we do a PowerPoint, we're, mm -hmm. we're supposed to act only like put three points per slide on there. Well, okay. and those points, um, they cannot, you cannot directly quote those points. You have I to, like that. You have to mm -hmm. know your own speech, and that's just for the people that you're talking to. Absolutely. That's very good. I challenge everyone, try just images. Don't have a single word on anything that you put up here, just images. And see how that comes across, because that helps to set the stage, doesn't it? I can talk about Chinese culture and the cuisine, but what happens if I show it to you? Suddenly, you're more into the moment, aren't you? You're more thinking, wow, that looks good. I'm ready to eat it. Thank you for explaining how you make dumplings to me. That's much more clear. I like images. I think they're fantastic. A lot of times, if I'm doing a training session or teaching, I prefer to use something that you remember. Who's going to remember this versus point A, point B, point C, point D, and my forgotten point down here? Which would you prefer? Absolutely. And with Prezi, it really flows smoothly. So you could just go from idea to idea. I love it. If you haven't tried it, it's absolutely free. You can hop on there and create an account today. Now, a lot of times we also like to cite our references, don't we? Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to share with you these references and I put them up here in APA or MLA format, what are you thinking? Boring. <laughs> Who's going to write it down and say, yeah, I'm going to go look at that book? That's why they want to it is. Everybody skips it. I cannot stand that in a college classroom. Don't do it. Just erase it from your mind right this moment. And how about I show you this? Next time you walk through a bookstore, who's going to see this and say, I'm going to remember that? That's how I get you to remember. That's how I bring it to life. My entire point with this competency is when you go to electronic sources, use them well. We have the power of Google, don't we? Let's use it. Let's make use of it. That's when we get to our last preparation competency, and this is all about organization. What happens when you're not organized? Uh, isn't that nice? I love that it's picture. Like a it is, isn't it? It's just, it's perfect. This is what my whole house looks like. I'm just kidding. I'm absolutely kidding. I wish. Do you want to see an example of what lack of organization looks like? Let's take a look. Raise your hand when this actually starts to get painful. Just raise your hand, hold it up. Oh, no. Well, the crops are um, growing very well, and um, they're organic, and some of them have pesticides, and I think that we should make um, a perfect pesticide for the crops that um, is good for people and healthy and keeps the crops preserved, too, because we need the food, because it's food and stuff. Who's enough? And organic food is good also. <laughs> That's how the entire thing goes. She's delivering in front of city council. She is trying to convince city council that we should grow maybe organic food, but in a few seconds she starts talking about vegetable trees. Vegetable trees. What are some of your immediate problems with this? What about her delivery style that you saw? Way too many filler words. I don't even hear the sentence, do I? She doesn't look confident at all. This, this motion right here, right? And then kind of this thing. How many seconds did you see? Uh, Two or three, not very many. But is this a confident speaker? No. no. 
Okay. You know what they look like. You want to be competent, have that organization. What is a simple organization? Say what you're going to say. Say it. Say what you said. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. Tell them what you told them. Introduction, body, and conclusion, right? This is something that we learned from the Greeks. Does she know this? Um, I would say that given that the length of most average state council presentations is around three minutes, mm -hmm. I guarantee you that a lot of those counselors and the people in the audience will start falling asleep after a lot of that. Oh, gosh. You actually see the little girl in the background fall asleep. And that always distracts me. I always focus on her. She's playing for a little while, and then she falls asleep. You fall asleep. We need to hear it. My introduction, my body, and conclusion. Whatever you're delivering on, put those three things together, and you will have a strong speech. So once we get away from preparation, that's where we go into what you actually do while you're up here. And this first competency is all about language and the language that we use. It has to be clear and relevant for our audience. So if I get up here and I start talking about SAP, and you really need to be aware of what SAP is and your APP, and you have to make sure that you track those so that when you use those within your academic career, you know exactly where you lie on your ROP. Who says I'm out of here? Forget you, I've had enough of that. I would, I don't wanna to listen to that. What did I just use a bunch of? You used a lot of abbreviations that people from outside that area might not be familiar. Exactly. You and mm -hmm. make them feel welcome. You have to make them feel welcome. We have a lot of jargon, don't we? We have a lot of jargon, a lot of language that we use. We have to make sure it's relevant. So if I talk about ROP and I say, you have to be aware of your ROP or known as rate of progress within your academic career. Suddenly, ROP isn't as intimidating, is it? It's a simple example, but make sure you think about your audience and the language that they use. There also happens to be language that we use maybe when we're angry or driving or get caught off, right? Do we use that language in a professional or college setting? Hope not. Don't. Absolutely do not. I was at a, a research analyst position once. Someone came in for a job interview, all day interview. At the lunch table, they're sitting there. We all ate lunch together. It was a cafeteria, wonderful atmosphere. And the HR individual was right across the table from them, the human resources individual. And she started cursing up a storm in front of this individual. Cursing and cursing and cursing. And words I thought, ooh, I haven't even heard that word. I don't even know what that means. Do you think she got the job? No, no she didn't. This is relevant everywhere, isn't it? Always professional, no matter what. Keep your language simple. You don't have to use this great long word that you discovered. Is it nice to just have that simplicity? Instead of ROP and making it sound grand, I could just say it's your rate of progress. It's the rate in which you complete your classes. Very simple. Who would want to read these? <laughs> That's a mess, isn't it? Absolute mess. Takes away from the meaning. Simplicity is your best friend with language. You have your own way of speaking. Use the way that you speak. Define your terms, that will help an audience to connect. Our next competency is about how we use our voice, what our voice sounds like. Who has recorded their voice before? Awesome, how does it sound? <laughs> Not like it. Not like it is. Ooh. Is it uncomfortable when you first hear your voice? It is. So I challenge you, keep recording your voice. Who has a cell phone in here? Who has a smartphone? with a recording feature, use it. Use it like crazy. The more you know your voice, the more effective you can be. Three parts of a voice are the volume, the way in which we use our rate, and our pitch. Our rate, we wanna make sure it's steady all the way throughout, because if I start talking really, really fast, and I'm covering a lot of information, and keep going on and on and on and on and on, who wants to listen to that? But I also don't wanna be too slow either, because, you would lose interest, right? Have to make sure I have that natural rate and that variance at it. With pitch, you don't wanna to be too high, but you also don't wanna to be too low. You want to be right in the middle there. Something to practice to make sure you have that confidence over that. And then volume. Volume's tricky, isn't it? I might sound really loud to myself, but in the back you might be saying, what? I have no idea what you're talking about. But also, it's kinda of nice to be a little quiet sometimes too, isn't it? Because suddenly the audience has to lean in and they have to pay attention. Who has seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Okay, good. Who has not seen it? All right, you've got to watch that movie immediately. 
Oh, good. Good, absolutely. I'm just going to show you a short clip from this. Take a look at it, and then we'll see what you think right afterwards. In 
So, is that professional? But if I just pause, and then we move to our next point. A little more professional? Absolutely, practice it. It will never get better unless you practice it. Love this movie, who's seen this movie? Okay, all right. Last competency, I say that because the hands always go down more and more over the years, so it's getting older. That's almost a 20 year old movie. Last competency is all about the physical behaviors you use while you're up here. As soon as you get up here, who thinks, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do with my hands? Or my feet? Or where am I supposed to look, right? What are some of those nonverbal behaviors that we use while we're up here? Let's just list some of them real fast. Go for it, just shout them out. Eye contact. Eye contact, excellent. Posture. And gestures. Gestures. Did I hear movement? Awesome. Any others? You like the fiddle. Fiddle? I will put that in gestures for now. That's a good one. Facial expression. Are there any others that we're missing? Fidgeting? I'll put that in movement for now. Any others? Okay, so who is comfortable with eye contact? Excellent. So when you get up here, you know where to look, right? Who says, absolutely not, I am not okay with eye contact, I don't know where to look? Okay, a couple of us. Sometimes you get in front of an audience and you think, gosh, I have no idea where to look, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But eye contact is powerful, isn't it? If you have that one person in the back of the room and they're texting or talking, what can you do as a speaker? Look at them. Absolutely look at them. It makes a big difference. Eye contact is powerful. It is intimidating though, isn't it? Even in a job interview, sometimes you have to do a presentation. You have to show off your skills. That eye contact has to be there. So two ways to make eye contact easier. First, take three objects in the room and talk to those objects. So over here, I've got an orange water bottle that I could talk to, right? And I'm talking and talking to that orange water bottle back there. It looks fantastic. But do you guys know that I'm looking at an orange water bottle? No. And then if I go over here and I'm talking maybe to the camera or the bag back there and really talking and letting the side of the audience know, well, who knows out here? Can't tell. Or if I get right over here and I know that there's that window shade and it's just fascinating to look at and I might just be talking to that and controlling my eye contact there. Looks like I'm looking at this side of the audience, right? So try that out. That gets you used to looking at everybody and inviting everybody into the conversation, even those who chat. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Next thing you can do is try looking in between the eyes. If you get in front of an audience and it's completely intimidating, try looking in between the eyes. Does anybody ever know? Absolutely not. And that gets you used to faces, and you will never worry about eye contact ever again. I can promise you that. Next for their posture. Who has great posture right now? Oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we're pretty relaxed, aren't we? What happens when you are slumped over, or what happens if you do this the whole time? Lazy. <laughs> Tired. And what if we do the all famous crossing the legs thing? I completely do that. But it looks like I'm going to topple over, doesn't it? And if you're nervous and you're doing this, it's not a good idea, is it? Absolutely not. Try to stand tall, because quite frankly, that helps you to be more alert. So try it out as soon as you're up here and practice it. Next with gestures. Who gets up here and they say, what are these things? What is this? Where did these come from? I don't know what these are. We kind of get into the Ricky Bobby syndrome, don't we? I'm not sure what to do with my hands. I just don't know what to do with my hands, right? No idea. What should you do with your hands? You should use your hands to uh, help emphasize key points, but don't use them too much because then it becomes. Don't use them too much. Do you need to look like you're landing a plane? No. No, it's kind of crazy. It looks bizarre, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. There's a couple things you can do, but my greatest tip to you is do you think about your gestures when you talk to your best friend? So why are you thinking about them while you're up here? There's no need to, right? But if you are the kind of person who lands a plane, what can you do? Tone it down a little bit. Tone it down by doing this. Give it a try. How does that feel? Try it out. Everybody try it. Silencing the musical. 
It does kind of, doesn't it? <laughs> Who have you seen doing this, though? Well, is there maybe a politician you see that does this gesture? Thank you. Can you think of maybe the president when he speaks? What do you always see his hand doing? He is doing this, not to just emphasize a point, but he's controlling his gestures. You'll see this a lot of times with newscasters. They'll do this. This actually tells your body that your gestures have to calm down. So if you're ever not sure what to do with your hands, give it a try. And then they will naturally relax. Also, film yourself. So it's just kind of like this? Just like that. Just like that. So you'll see people starting to do this. It's very natural, and it tells your body to calm down. Don't get stuck in this, though, because then you get those T-Rex arms, and that just looks awkward. Film yourself. Film yourself on your phone trying these gestures out, and you'll see where it relaxes and looks natural. You'll never think about it again. If those hands start to come up and you're not sure what to do, you can help them to relax. Next with movement, what should our movement look like? Not um, don't pace back and forth. Yeah. I just want to say don't move around way too much. No. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. If you've had three shots of espresso in the morning and you're up here and you know you've got to run around the classroom, try not to do that. Always pick three points in the room that you'll move to. And one of the most important points is if I want to drive a point home, and if I want to let the audience know that I am not just up there, I'm a part of you, and I'm a part of this discussion, do I have your attention if I talk from the room back here? No. If I say, let's analyze this picture and the gestures within the picture, suddenly I have your attention, don't I? And then where do you have to turn your head to see me? You actually have to move. If I get up here and I stand in the same place the entire time, do you fall asleep? Yeah. Absolutely. Do we always get stuck behind this thing up here? What's this called? A podium. It's not a podium. It's not a stage. What's this thing? We have our notes on there. It's not a desk. Lectern, I think it's called. Lectern. It is a lectern. If anyone told you this is a podium, that is incorrect. What is a podium? Excellent. It was fantastic. I have classrooms where they have no idea. They really have no idea, but this is your podium, isn't it? I am standing on my podium and sharing my speech. Use that podium. If you ever see a lectern, what should you do with it? There is a lovely little corner for it, or you can get it under the table, right? What does it do when I break that barrier away? A lectern is for lecturing, isn't it? Do you want to lecture? No. A speech is about connecting to the audience, so get rid of it and break that barrier. Finally, our facial expressions. This one's very important to me. Very, very important. I had a freshman student at a public speaking course who decided to go ahead and deliver her first speech. And she started giggling. Giggling even more. Giggling even more than that to the point where she was out and out laughing. Guess what her topic was? It wasn't about laughing a lot. That would have been a great topic yeah. for her. It was about death. <laughs> it was about death. <laughs> oh my God. I would think that's kind of immoral. She never returned to the class. <laughs> if you are a fun, laughing person, should you do a very serious topic? No. Do you think my topics are very serious in the beginning? No. No. Oh, no. Unless they can act. Acting's a great tool. No. If you're a fun person, make sure that topic is fun. But if you're a more serious person, you say, I approach this seriously, should your first topic be something fun and lighthearted that you want to make everyone laugh with? Depends on the topic. I probably wouldn't approach it. Make sure your facial expression matches your topic. No more newscasters talking about disasters while doing this, right? Ever seen that? No, they have a very hypothetic pose. Mm -hmm. That smile, though. That smile drives me up the wall. I've seen CEOs apologize while smiling. Is that a sincere apology? No. No. Unless you're really smiling person. Maybe. 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 And now you've been taught the eight public speaking competencies. What should you do? 
just turn away. Yeah, I can't do it. You just turn away. Would it help to perhaps practice a couple times before you get in here, though? Yeah. No, because then when I actually have to do it, I giggle more than. <laughs> I would practice more. I practice more. I'm not the type of person who takes on those topics. I'm not going to lie. I don't take on those topics. But while I'm up here, I take that deep breath and I practice enough to know that this is going to be serious. Absolutely serious. Luckily, you get to choose your topic a lot of times. So you're not locked into a topic. So be yourself while you're up here. These are the eight public speaking competencies. But if there's two things that you can absolutely take home today and say, this is what I learned. They need to be the two rules of public speaking because that is what makes you a competent speaker. This helps, this is a good format, but what is the first rule of public speaking? You can be nervous. Nerves are good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like nerves. They help you get that energy while you're up here. First rule of public speaking. Um, I would think know your topic. Know your topic, that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Let's go a little further than that. First work on your prepping and then go to your That goes into it. My first rule is be yourself. Be yourself whenever you're speaking in public because you are an incredible person and you have a lot that you can bring up here. Don't try to be a public speaker and don't try to be that person or that person. Be yourself. What should the second rule be? I am up here playing with my bracelets or doing this whole thing. And add the ums and uhs. And what are you all paying attention to right now? Is that annoying? Yeah. Don't do anything distracting. Be yourself and don't do anything distracting and you will seek out success. That's what talkology is all about. Can anyone tell me what talkology means? The study of talk. And why should we study the art of talking? It's a way of life. Good luck finding a career where you don't communicate with anyone. You must be working on Mars. You must be doing a reality TV show. I don't know. I'm sure there's something out there, but you will be talking. Gain the competencies. Be yourself. Don't do anything distracting, and you will be in good shape. So right now, I open this up to any questions that you might have. I know you're dying to ask questions. We're thinking with the silence. I think with the silence, I like that. Excellent. Like a lot of times, like when I'm giving a presentation or something, I know my topic really well, and I have a perfect idea in my mind of what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, whenever I actually talk about it in front of a group of people, like a speech format, I always end up sounding like I have no clue what I'm talking about. How many times do you practice before you deliver? Maybe like once just running through my head. Speak out loud. Deliver it completely out loud before you ever get up here and those words will start to stick with you. If this is your first run, it will fall apart. How many times have I delivered this? Definitely more than once. <laughs> Learn it, make it a part of you, and it will come across. I used to do the same thing. I'd get up completely blank. I'd even black out and not be able to tell you what I said. Practice makes a big difference. Try it out. Even if it's in front of your phone and you play it back, it makes a big difference. Other thoughts? Ideas, questions, complaints, comments? Okay. <laughs> Well, I hope that this definitely helped in your future. I wish I had had these lessons before I got into college. My first speeches were a disaster because I didn't even have those two simple rules. So embracing yourself, embrace talking, communication, no matter what you do. My name, again, is Katie Purrier. I have it up here because I know my last name's a little crazy spelling-wise. And thank you all for being here. I think it's great to have the summit. It's great what you're doing. And enjoy the campus. Doesn't CC beautiful? I love it here. Have a wonderful rest of your day.